Broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne, this is Wilms Front, brought to you by theunshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wilms. How are you, Liam? Good, thanks. How are you, Tim? Yeah, I'm good. And uh, now... This is how I'm, I've decided I'm going to, to do the shows now, rather than call the guests after I've I've done uh, my introduction. I'll just have you or sit. Uh, basically, you're in some sort of green room for the first fifteen minutes. Oh yeah, yeah. Mm. But it means that our audience doesn't have to hear the Skype uh, call music because I've tried to figure out a way to mute it, but I haven't been able to. So they hear this loud Skype ringtone. Yeah. Hmm. But yeah, enough of the small talk. Uh, let, let, let's get into because, I, as I said in my introduction, young conservative Queensland. It's like obviously it's a. Some people would say it's like it's a niche page, but you're pretty proactive in. You haven't just done videos. You've also uh, been out and about at uh, schoolies. Uh, that that was sort of a short documentary that uh, that you did i'll first get you to uh explain what young conservatives queensland is sure um well we were essentially a formation of the australian conservatives of cory Bernardi's party but we were never officially part of it and we acted quite autonomous during the year and a half um we've been around uh so we were able to host events by ourselves and have both liberal politicians lmp and other parties come to our events and then during the election, we were very pro Australian Conservatives and all helped out during the election. And since that time, we've kind of since the party's been disbanded, we're still around and we're looking at becoming a network for Conservatives. So it doesn't matter what party you are, we're going to be that network and that social group that can kind of unite Conservatives uh, in terms of elections and other activities. Yeah, that's exactly what we need all over the country. But yeah, as as, as I said, your, your page was very active, and uh, even though Cory Bernardi he's now deregistering Australian Conservatives, it hasn't by any means basically met the the death uh, of your page. And it's often uh, talked about that Conservatives there needs to be networks, organisations, ways for to meet people and also learn how to be activists and so yeah it's i think i think that up in queensland you're making a great start yeah it's, a, it's not we get a lot of messages on the page and it's quite a common one we keep getting is these people keep coming to us these young uh people who have started calling themselves conservative to their friends and their family and they get completely shut out because their friends and family tend to be left-leaning and then they find themselves with no friend and no group to go to. So they message us and they come to us and they kind of start to find that and start making friends and how to actually get involved in politics as well. So it's quite quite good what we're doing. Now, one of the uh, topics that I wanted to explore with you is uh, what does it mean to be young conservative in the, the current year? Because we're living in the, as I said in my introduction, the woke social justice warrior age. And so, so many definitions are changing. And so conservatism has, I'd say, evolved over the past 20 years. I'm a bit older than you, so I've sort of seen the evolution of conservatism. Uh, to give uh, the audience a bit of introduction to your work, I'm just going to play uh, the Queensland Young Conservatives core values, which uh, you... Uh, which you set out in one of the, the videos. It only goes for two minutes, but I think that it'll be a good introduction to see just your work and then afterwards we can go into uh, a bit more discussion about uh, those values. Hi everyone, it's Liam from Younger Service Queensland and today I want to talk about what our core values are within the group. They come down to five core values, which are very similar to what the Australian Conservatives were and they are limited government, personal responsibility, free enterprise, strong family values and freedom of speech, association and religion. Our first core value is limited government. We believe that the government should be the smallest size possible in order for the people and the citizens to have the most amount of liberty possible. It should be down to the bare essentials of law and order and defence and interaction with foreign governments where freedom inside the country can flourish properly. Where big government and bureaucracy on the other hand has always led to tyranny. 
Our second core value is personal responsibility. We believe that the individual is ultimately responsible for their own actions. We are very against the victimhood mentality and blaming others for one's own fault. We are against the nanny state and we believe that the government should treat its citizens as adults. Our third core value is free enterprise. We believe that the free market system is the most efficient economic structure in the world and provides the best chance for people to create wealth for themselves. It teaches the more one puts out, the more that they can earn back. Compared to other systems, that teaches dependency on the state. Our fourth core value is family. We believe that a solid family structure provides the best and greatest upbringing for children. We celebrate the unique roles that fathers and mothers have when raising children and we believe that the family is a solid foundation for modern society. Our fifth core value is freedom of speech, religion and association. We believe that people should be able to say what they want without fear of government or societal censorship because speech is subjective. What may offend one person may not offend the other and if we start bringing in censorship, it is a dangerous path towards tyranny because we have to ask the question, who decides what to censor? People should be able to practice whatever religion they want and form whatever clubs and societies they desire as long as they are not practicing or promoting violence. So there you have it everyone, there are cool values, we'll be writing them up and putting them on our website in the coming weeks so you'll be able to see them outside of this video and in the next few weeks as well we're going to be doing a new video segment which is going to be called Quash Thought which is a play on my last name which is Quasha and it's essentially my opinions and solutions to current world events that I see and that's due to my background in the military, immigration and what I'm studying at university at the moment, international relations. So at the end of that uh... Uh, video there you also gave a brief biography of yourself now you're 25 yes yeah. yeah and yeah you've already done a lot in life you've been in the military done immigration work and now you're uh you're studying so in in such a <laughs> as such a young life you you've already done so much uh, a lot of 25 year olds wouldn't have that worldly experience Mm, yeah, and it's definitely fine, especially at uni, um, where a lot of the people are younger and they're not as mature compared to people who do come in later, especially in the military where you get that a lot of that life experience and skills to take that into later life. So it's worked out well and helped me along with my studies as well. And I, I'm following the, the live chat and yeah, everyone, the, the immediate reaction to you has been all positive. Um, I don't mean to sort of like diminish um, the seriousness of this show, but there's been a lot of comments that have like said uh, Chad in response to uh, seeing you on, on camera. <laughs> yes, I, I saw some of them. <laughs> now, going back to the, the conservative uh, values. Now, it seems to me the the way that I interpreted how I saw that video is that modern conservatives, young conservatives these days are basically libertarians but they have more uh, they they place importance on community values and ba basically they 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 want a firm grounding for society not a free-for-all essentially yeah i mean those called values are, are values that essentially don't change compared to other values which are up for debate and everything uh but we are quite classical and liberalism and libertarian in the sense of uh, how the economy works and then we get uh, a lot of conservative values in terms of how society uh, works and that's when you see the family values and uh, personal responsibility and such. And like obviously as I mentioned uh, I'm a bit older than you so I've seen the definition of uh, conservative change. Uh, I was a teenager like during the early 2000s where it was social conservatism that was really the the core value and like sexual restraint that was that was pushed quite a bit like uh like young people were encouraged to wear purity rings and uh, like that's that sort of thing there was a there was a lot more grounding in sort of like morality well, not just mo like morality as like just a brief uh general principle but serious restraint and obviously like we saw a few years later there were all these sort of like sex scandals like well it's, it's happening today there the hypocrisy angle with you know i just spoke about in the introduction uh justin trudeau like the the progressives are the new mm. hypocrites because they don't live uh what they what they preach so yeah. obviously in 2019 we have things like uh, same-sex marriage uh we, we actually see probably the the feminists they're the anti-sex 
people these days. So in terms of like when you say family uh, values and personal responsibility, what, because there's a sort of the differentiation ones, like what do they mean to you? Mm. Well, personal responsibility is we see the individual is ultimately responsible for their own actions and we are against the, against the victimhood mentality and blaming others for our own faults where family values, on the other hand, is a strong, solid family structure, which we see as the best chance for the upbringing of children. So the classic example is the nuclear family model. And obviously, there's a lot of talk about modern families. And if you're, you're for uh, family values or traditional, for example, when Cory Bernardi published his conservative revolution, he was uh, accused of diminishing more than families and this is sort of something that conservatives have, have struggled with this I, I wouldn't say struggled with but like adapting to because like modernity is just warped into this and obviously there are excesses of it but there's sort of certain aspects of it that you know need to be accommodated mm, yeah it, i mean it there is this new type of family structure developing but especially in australia there's that long a uh, solid family structure that has been the nuclear family in the past. So this changes has been coming due to the progressive values and it's diminishing the family structure that has worked so well before. And so we feel that maintaining that uh, structure is the best chance to start branching out in other values. I would say that probably the, the social value that has to this day has been non-negotiable for conservatives as that of valuing human life. And we've seen that obviously with the, the pro-life activism in New South Wales. Unfortunately, uh, in Queensland, uh, your Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk and her uh, Deputy Commissar uh, Jackie Trad uh, forced through uh, abortion law reform in, in that state. It was a shame that there was not a greater fight, even though a lot of the LNP voted against it but it seems that i would say that young conservatives that that is probably a core value that i think everyone would say a conservative should share that you shouldn't kill the vulnerable whether they're like a fetus to to use that that term because you know, a fetus it's still you know you can see human in it and also the the elderly as well because we're seeing euthanasia uh, it's been legalized in state of victoria there's a push for it in in western australia basically a uh, uh, part of the progressive agenda has been the uh, uh, the the dehumanization of well as the word says humanity and so that is sort of something which I think uh, conservatives have, have always uh, valued. It is, yeah, and that's one of our values that we are very strong on as well, we're very pro-life. And especially in one of the interviews I did in our segment Four Fast Questions last year, I interviewed Wendy Francis, who was one of the uh, main advocates uh, for pro-life and tried to fight the Labor Party against the bill that passed in Queensland. And what she was telling me was during that process was that Labor weren't meeting them regularly to go through the bill and talk about the process. They kept delaying when they were meeting and doing all these inconsistencies in terms of making the bill pass, as we see a lot in New South Wales. But we do tell people who want to get involved with young conservatives, especially with our core values, that there are certain values outside of the core values and issues that we are very strong on, such as pro-life and euthanasia and everything like that. And we believe that conservatives do tend to be pro-life in that regard. Another one of your values is free speech and uh, religion and association. Now, this is is probably the conundrum of our time. I'm a free speech absolutist, so you can say anything as long as it it's not an incitement to immediate violence. That, that that's how I see it. But of course, we're seeing all these these hate speech uh, laws that are passing uh, throughout the, the West. There's a proposal uh, in the state of Victoria to extend uh, hate speech provisions. And conservatives have, for the most part, they're pretty strong in it. Uh, but I'm not sure if you're religious, uh, are you? Um, no, I did grow up in Christianity and I went to an Anglican school. Uh, but I do 
understand the importance that Christianity has in Western culture, and I like Christian values, but currently I consider myself a Stoic, and with Stoicism, which has very similar values to Christianity, but it places more emphasis on the self. And that's what young conservatives are. We understand that connection Christianity has with Western values, especially Australian values, and we do express that. Because this is where I think conservatives have sort of struggled a, a bit, because there was, I, th I think, we're, we're, we're seen in the UK, like obviously the, uh, with the, the, uh, the public voting for, for Brexit, and you've seen the, the Remainers that like chuck the, the biggest tantrum we've ever seen and trying to block it every step of the way. And this might be unpopular for me to say, but I think there was a bit of hysteria like in the Christian community over them losing that same-sex marriage vote. Like, for example, there was the there was a vigilante who painted over a, a, a mural which was deemed offensive to Christians because it mocked Tony Abbott and, and George Powell. And we've seen the push for a religious discrimination act, which I've very much opposed because I don't want to go back to the days of, of blasphemy laws. And I think Christians have to be aware that they shouldn't become snowflakes either because like, for example, today, like Kyle Sanderlands, he's in trouble because he's made some disparaging marks about the, the Virgin Mary. And a lot of Christians have complained, even some Muslims have complained. And some people have been saying he wouldn't say that about Muhammad, for example, which I, I'm, I'm kind of over that sort of like, you wouldn't say that about Muhammad because it's like, as I said, I'm a free speech absolutist. Like, you can mock or ridicule what what you want to do and yeah like there's atheist bigots in in in, in the community and the, the the way that i see it obviously kyle sandlands he's a shock jock like he's after attention don't don't take the bait i have the same attitude with someone like Catherine devaney who calls uh anzac day bogan halloween uh, says our farmers get special uh treatments like we should not get triggered and act like snowflakes ourselves. We should be consistent. Well, I may find that personally offensive, but it's still free speech and, you know, I'll just ignore them. Yeah, that's exactly right. Like speech should be absolute. You'd be able to say whatever you want about fear or government or societal censorship. And I, I kind of follow Stephen Crowd and what he says in this, that you should be able to say what you want. And the only line is when it's an action. When you call an action on someone, call the violence and everything, that's when you say that's not free speech. Where you should be able to, in terms of free speech, it should be say what you want without fear of being censored whatsoever. Yeah, and I think that's, uh, you agree with me, and uh, yeah, I just want to make the point, like use this platform yeah. to emphasize that conservatives, they've got to not get sort of caught up in the, the culture wars where they're too reactionary. And that's, mm. that's why I think it's good that you did that video of like, core principles, because if you don't, have core principles and you're just in a culture war day to day, then it's easy to fall into the hypocrisy, double standard path. It is. And then you can also turn out like parties like the LNP and Labour, where you get two different factions that essentially destroy the party and they get nothing done. There's the conservative faction and the LNP and the moderates and the moderates try to gain power and there's just all political infighting and not stability to try and uh, go forward in the country. It does become an issue where we have these core values that are the uniting values, when then you can have other issues which you can debate about, but you need core principles to be able to go forward. And also one of your values is the, the free market. So you're a supporter of, of capitalism, as am I, but the free market, it's starting to fall out of favour with many on who would say they're, they're on the, the right. For example, Trump, uh, ran on a platform and was elected president uh, uh, promising to uh, roll back uh, free trade. He's obviously wanting to make sure that uh, offshoring doesn't continue to happen, like offering, in, like some would call them incentives for companies to ha uh, remain their operations in the United States. Some would call it a strong arm in. Even though Trump's a businessman, he's certainly using government uh, in the the market and i think the probably the best reflection of sort of this change from uh i, I guess uh free market conservatism to what's called nationalist conservatism is is tucker carlson where he 
he talks about how, because there's, that's another thing, there's a lot of rage against these uh, corporations these days who are engaging in what's called corporate virtue signaling, go work, go mm. broke. And we've seen actually Business Council of Australia this week saying, you know, we need to uh, tone this down. So a lot of right-wingers are, are angry at the uh, the corporations, which used to be like the, the lefties, Ugh, the corporations, but that's coming from the, the, the right these days. And... Like certainly a a corporation is its person, so it, like, that's how it's classified in law. So it can still do like as long as it's within the laws, it can still it can support these these causes uh, if they want. But I'm sure you'll agree with me that we don't live in what's termed cowboy capitalism, a uh, complete free market, because there's so much interventions that protect monopolies and make startups so difficult. It is, yeah. Uh, and that's that's a thing that keeps happening. And you'll see that the left time uh, tend to agree with it as well. It's corporatism, where they see big business working with government, where true capitalism is limited government and limited government interference in the economy. But you do need some government interference to prevent things like monopolies forming. And we can see that with Facebook and Google become these giant monopolies with little regulation. Um, but if you come back to that, limit that capitalist sense of small business is what we tend to push for as well. And we've seen a few uh, corporations actually defy the, the, the trend. Uh, in your home state of Queensland, there was the SCD America Vehicles, where it's actually been taken down now, but the, the operator of that, Eddie uh, Kawa, uh, released uh, a remix of Peter Dutton's uh, Visit. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. and calling him the, the baddest MP and yeah, that, one, yeah. He, he like and when I was researching his company he did a promotional video for Peter Dutton's campaign but the aftermath of that was pretty intense but it, uh, like you know with the abuse that they received but it's basically if you research that it's, it's all like they it's basically the same template coming from like you may get a thousand emails but coming from like if you, you know do sort of the digital footprint probably comes from about 20 people yeah, yeah. Mm. It, yeah, it is interesting as well. And I saw it as well with this corporate virtue signaling in my, when I did my social media as elective in last semester. And a lot of the people, they loved the idea of corporations jumping on certain values, which is an issue because values are subjective in terms of when these companies sit going for progressive values and they do tend to lose money as well. But it's also interesting seeing stuff like that with uh, Dutton. Uh, now, I'll give another chat uh, update because in this show, it's always important to acknowledge the, the live audience and interact with it because often the live chat is is half the, the, the show in, in these live productions. There's a lot of what I described as nationalist conservatives in there not liking uh, what we are saying, which is, which is fine. Um, but obviously, you and I are not saying the status quo is, is fine, which I think especially a lot of the libertarians make saying that the free market as it is is fine. That's, it's not a complete free market. We definitely agree there needs to be a reform, mm. but obviously the national capitalists, oh, sorry, national conservatives have uh, other things in mind. Mm. Yeah, indeed. Now I want to talk, uh, go back to your home state of Queensland because it's to use the word, it's a diverse uh, state and there is, more and more of the state's population is being concentrated in the southeast. Uh, Brisbane and the Gold Coast, you're on the Gold Coast, uh, which is, well, it's a safe LNP area, but it's a, it's a tourist area. So even though there's a lot of elderly people who live in the, the retirement places, it's pretty youthful a lot of the time. Yeah, it is. Um, I think I read somewhere that it's the city with the most restaurants per capita in the world which is always interesting. There's always places to go. And if you do get bored, you just go up to Brisbane. Um, but it is a bit difficult in terms of politics where that's where a lot of the progressives are. It's intended to be in the cities where if you go out into the country and especially up in North Queensland, you'll find more conservative following up there. And I've already made some disparaging comments about uh, your Premier and, and Deputy Premier. And I, I basically see the pair of them as almost a clone copy of what we have down here in Victoria with, with Daniel Andrews. They, because Queensland only has uh, a unicameral parliament, one chamber of parliament, which means 
whichever party wins the majority, they can just pass whatever they want. There's no Senate, upper house to basically amend things, water down things. So, yeah, the uh, Labor, Labor government can do whatever they want. And in Brisbane, uh, we've covered a lot on the Unshackled. Uh, there is quite the green left Antifa Marxist hub in Brisbane, which is West End, and that falls within Jackie Trad's electorate, who is the deputy premier. Mm -hmm. And so you've basically seen Brisbane uh, shut down multiple times with these Extinction Rebellion climate protesters still uh, wanting to stop the Adani coal mine in central Queensland, which the, the Queensland voters during the federal election overwhelmingly voted for. Uh, now the Labor Party has no seats uh, north of uh, Brisbane and she, she's basically had to be dragged uh, kicking and screaming to actually pass stricter laws basically to stop these people or deter them from gluing themselves to the road and well, they've put canoes on the road. They've just basically tried to be disruptive as possible. Yeah, it is. It'll be interesting to see how the election goes for them because she's obviously seen what happened in the federal election and is concerned about what's going to happen next year for her in the Queensland election. And if these protests continue, it's not going to work in her favour and we'll probably most likely see um, LNP gain some seats because it's hard for small parties and more conservative parties, especially when there's no Senate to gain uh, seats. So unless the party is well funded, uh, has a good movement, a good set of values, and it's going to be extremely difficult to get into the Queensland Parliament. Uh, so it's really going to be between LNP and uh, Labor at the moment, up, unless you go up north where there's Catter's party as well. Yeah, that's what, what I call, it's basically the North Queensland party, which we'll get to mm. in a moment. Um, now the LNP opposition leader, Deb Frecklington, she, uh, her electorate's in the Darling Downs, which she is in the southwest of the the state which is uh, old uh, joe jockey peterson uh, country the the fiercely uh, conservative national premier who uh ruled the state for for, for 20 years to uh put it put it in a sort of neutral uh, term and like she, she i see her on sky news all the time she she does seem a genuinely principled conservative lady is that the impression that you get do you know who she is a bit more than probably us outsiders uh not too much she hasn't really come up um over our end but uh yeah she probably does come up a bit conservative um we don't tend to see it so it'd be interesting to see what happens there and the the key question is if anastasia palaszczuk wants to remain premier she's got to somehow shaft Jackie Trad, who she seems to be some sort of a, a, a what's, what, what's the polite way to say it? She, she's an enforcer. Uh, uh, she, mm. She's basically one of those labor hard, you know, really, really like gruff ones. And so it seems that she's going to have to be blasted out of her position. And as I said, her voting base is Antifa. Yeah, so it would be interesting to see if they keep her on board and how well they do in the election. And especially if they do use groups like Antifa during the election, they'll definitely use get up in terms of their seats. Uh, so it'll be very interesting to see how they go. I don't think they're going to do well if they keep uh, these protests going and everything. So we'll see how next year goes. Now, as I mentioned, Labor holds no seats north of Brisbane and the Adani mine in central Queensland, uh, all of those seats in central Queensland, there was like 10% swings to the, the LNP, uh, One Nation and Clive Palmer's party polled uh, well. And then of course, in North Queensland, central North Queensland, that's Catter country. And there's now a push for uh, North Queensland to become a separate state, which is driven in part by the the Kata, uh party, uh, but uh, certainly I think a lot of central Queenslanders would like to be part of that state as well, because there is such a, a demographic shift to the, the southeast and urban, it's becoming more urbanised, the, the state, and so you have two basically different different parts of Australia basically and it seems that because we are a federation and each state does have a separate culture and 
I fully support a another sovereign state. The the people of North Queensland they shouldn't be able shouldn't have to put up with Jackie Trad uh, calling the shots. And I know that Matt Canavan, the Federal Resources Minister, uh, he's certainly indicated not total support, but he's certainly like you know this is something we should consider. Yeah, yeah, um, it is a we support it as well. We believe that it's a good uh, approach to take. And a lot of people, especially in North Queensland, they do see. A lot of funding going down to the the cities, especially southeast Queensland. So that's why this push is going. So they become their own state, create their own economy, and start making the lives up there better. Now the state is just called uh, uh, like the proposed name at the moment is just North Queensland. I actually mm -hmm. came up with a name the other day myself. I think it should be called uh, Kingsland. Yeah, yeah, Kingsland. I like that name too. I like to always say because the king should be above the queen. Yes. Yes, yeah, so we'd be sending quite a a strong uh, message to to the rest of the country. Yeah, and then you could tell your friends and family you got some land up in Kingsland, got mm. a house. Sounds nice. Well, we're going to have a few kings uh, soon uh, in Australia, or, uh, overseeing Australia. Oh yeah. Oh well, <laughs> I, I'm talking about the British monarchy, of course. Yes. 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 Yeah. Um, it'll be interesting to see if they have Charles in because he's quite an unpopular and very outspoken hmm. prince. Um, I think it was in the original House of Cards, um, the British one, the BBC one, where in the second yes, season I they saw had that. come in. Hmm. Yeah, and he was supposed to be Charles and he was quite a socialist as well, yes. very pro-climate change. And we all know how that ended, but let's mm. not go on on that ta tangent. No. Yeah, <laughs> obviously, um, You've been in the the military, which uh, has obviously, like, well, it's it's called the Australian Defence Force, but most people think of the ADF as being deployed overseas to uh, various uh, disputes. In mo most most common ones have been in the the, the Middle East uh, over the past uh, twenty years, but obviously, I mentioned East Timor previously. Australia sent a lot of peacekeepers. Uh, there, so it's not surprising that uh, global geopolitics says has pricked your interest, and now you're studying international relations at, at university. And you mentioned at the end of that video uh, the the core values that uh, that uh, thoughts. You've just launched the first episode of that about China, and there there's three types of uh, perspectives Australians have on China. There's there's a China bull, which is, we've had uh, Dave Lee on this show previously. He is what I call a China bull, basically that China is the, the greatest uh, threat that we face uh, to basically the security and advancement of our, our nation. That's something that also uh, the outgoing Asia boss, uh, Duncan Lewis, said that espionage from basically meant from China. Uh, that is the uh, uh, that is the the greatest threat to our nation, even more than terrorism. And then, of course, um, uh, Andrew Hasty, his op-ed talking about we need to recognise the the threat from from China and not fall into past mistakes. But you are what I'd call a China bear. You have a different uh, view on what's what's going to happen with the People's Republic of China uh, in the next decade or so? Yeah, because I'm very critical of China, because when we're talking about them being the threat to the West, then we're talking about a complete change of the world order. So I tend to look very critically about who the next rival is going to be. And since in my studies, China has come up quite a bit uh, during the course of my last year and a half or so. And I follow certain people, Brett Stevens and George Friedman, and they talk about China as well, but they're very critical and they gave me a lot of this insight into it may not be as strong as it seems. And so that's when I start getting these ideas, especially the economy, it's more fickle than you can see, and the military, during my background, um, you can, I look very closely at that, especially the equipment experience and the training they have. And I add it all together and I see China not being as strong in the future and could possibly uh, collapse in the next couple of decades. But then it always comes back to that nothing grows forever. So China's economy has been growing, but it won't grow forever. And it's slowing down very quickly, especially with the trade tariffs that we see with um, uh, the trade war with Trump as well. And it's one China, uh, one child policy. Uh, that is also a ticking time bomb because of a, a aging population. And then of course, uh, because 
uh, Chinese culture values uh, sons over daughters. There's the whole other thing about uh, girls being aborted and yeah, horrible sort of things like that. But there's also now a nation of uh, uh, Chinese male bachelors. And so there, there's going to be that uh, demographic pri crisis. It is, yeah. And that's one of the topics that's going to come up in my next um, video on Course Thought is population. And big one for China is that's what I, I, I look at the big essence of what the population is going to do in the future. And with China, they've artificially affected their fertility and population in a way that it's skewed the gender rate so there's way more men than females. And there's this that 900 million labor force that's going to start shrinking if there's no more uh, children in the future because their fertility rate is way below replenishment. So they're already going into population decline at the moment and it's predicted that they're going to lose 500 million people in the future and that's going to shrink their economy massively when their population is a big part of the economy. The other states of concern uh, geopolitically, well, it's been in the news this week, Iran, uh, they've been blamed for the, the drone attacks on two Saudi Arabia oil production facilities. And uh, there's been the talk, will the United States uh, go to war with Iran? There's certainly a lot of uh, uh, neocons in the Trump administration who would like that, such as Mike Pompeo, John Bolton's not there anymore. But I've looked at how this is unplayed in the, the news this week, and I remember with the uh, Iraq war, uh, that was sold as, you know, we've got to liberate Iraq, free its people, and anti-war activists at the time said, this is blood for oil. But it seems in 2019, we're basic, uh, everyone's being pretty blunt that this is about oil security. We are only going to go to war to basically make sure that we have fuel security, which yeah, it's that's never a justification for for war in in my view. No, no, it's not. And Trump, in terms of how he's been handling the foreign policy, he's been quite smart in regards to how he's been handling it. There was a couple of months ago when he that drone was shot down by Iran, and then he was about to do that uh, strike against the country, but then he stopped when he found out how many people he'd kill if he did the strike, and he didn't deem the loss of an unmanned drone for loss of life. But if it comes to loss of life, particularly American lives, I believe Trump will react with force. But in terms of just invading for resources, it's never justified. I always, because people always get freaked out when, like, because he had his uh, tweet after the, the drone attack saying we're locked and loaded. And mm. the, the, the Trump derangement syndrome is like, oh, he's become unhinged. But mm. like Trump treats the, pre like, uh, approaches his role as, as president, as, as a businessman, art of the deal. Most businessmen are terrible at politics, but Trump, because his whole career has been based around real estate deals, that's perfect for politics. And so he's doing it through Twitter, which is a new form of art of the deal. And so when he says stuff like that, you know that that's a, a, a deal making move of his. And so, so as, Know, Trump, uh, Trump supporters, we know that, like, you know, he's, he's not going to basically nuke them. But I will say this about Trump, that he ends up doing the right thing, but, the, like, he shouldn't have done the wrong thing in the first place. Like, he shouldn't have hired John Bolton as National Security Advisor in the first place, and he shouldn't have torn up the Iran deal in the first place either. He comes to the right point of view eventually, but it would have been a whole lot easier if he'd just, like, not done these things in the first place. Yeah, yeah, I think it's like a learning process for him as well, where he takes people on the word when he hires them. And it was interesting with John Bolton as well, when I kept reading reports that, and articles where he had him around as his kind of, uh, his like threat in, in, in a way. And then he'll be, uh, cause he knew all the people that knew and all the other leaders knew that John Bolton wanted to invade. So he'd have him around as that kind of threat when Trump would try and create a deal. But uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how the foreign policy plays out with him gone and, um, how that's going to play, but yeah. There's been a lot of talk that, uh, you know, the, the deep state, that's that's become a topic of uh, discussion on the news and, and the internet in the era of Trump because the the United States deep state, it, it, it has well-established foreign policy goals. And it seems that Trump, he's, he's doing what he can to placate them so he doesn't provoke them too much. 
Uh, is that something that you've thought about and analysed? It is. Cause if, if, in terms of if the deep state is there, that means it's very rooted and deep in every aspect of the government. So if Trump wants to really take that out, he does have to act smart in how he's going to handle that. So that thing of draining the swamp, he has to kind of figure out a way to expose them. And I believe that with all these issues, and the, especially the Democrats trying to take him down with um, impeachment and everything, that's kind of his way of drawing out the deep state and exposing them for the hypocrites that they are. So hopefully that goes well and it will work in his favour, but it'll be extremely difficult to take them out in that way. Mm. I mean, he has successfully taken over the Republican Party. It's now the Trump mm. Republican Party, like Ted Cruz and Lindsey Graham, who hated him during the, the, the primaries. And they, they all said some very nasty things about each other, uh, are basically uh, two of his biggest spruikers in uh, the Congress now. Yeah, yeah, it is interesting how they all used to hate him. They didn't endorse him during the election, and now they all love him because they see exactly what he's done to the party, and especially a lot of conservatives. Well, that's politics. You can hate mm. somebody uh, at one point and then a few years later, you're best friends. Yeah, yeah that happens. <laughs> now, obviously, what came up uh, during the first uh, two and a half years of Trump's presidency was uh, the threat of foreign interference from Russia because they're, they're, uh, it, it was widely reported in the media and suspected by uh, US intelligence authorities that. Uh, Russian propaganda and Russian online bots were wanting Trump to be president because he always said that he wanted to get along with Vladimir Putin. And of course, there's all these conspiracies that Russia has incriminating evidence of him, including uh, certain things that go it went on in a hotel room, uh, which uh, everyone knows what I'm uh, referring to. So we had the, the, the Mueller special counsel investigation, which all it found was that members of his campaign met with Russian officials, but there was no collusion. But they, like, can't, like uh, political operatives talk with diplomats all the time. There was no evidence of uh, collusion, and it still hasn't been proved that uh, Russia hacked the DNC and gave it to, to WikiLeaks. That's certainly what MSNBC, CNN say, but that hasn't uh, been proved. And so I just want to get your assessment on the Russia situation because it seems to be a US uh, a deep state uh, fixation. I know that when Tony Abbott was prime minister with the shooting down of uh, MH17 uh, over, over Ukraine, uh, Tony Abbott famously said, I want a shirt front, uh, Mr. Putin. And so, but that is sort of fizzled out uh, now. So where do you see Russia on the geopolitical stage? Well, it comes back to what they're trying to aim geopolitically. And if you look at what Putin's doing, he's essentially trying to gain back the old USSR states, the old Soviet Union territories, especially in Eastern Europe. But in terms of their economy and their population, they're in quite a similar state to China as well. They have a very powerful military. You have to give them that. And that's probably the biggest threat to America, not so much China's, but Russia's very technologically technological advance compared to um, China. But the population on the other hand, where many believe that Russia will never be a superpower again, one, because same issues that China's having with fertility, but also their population is extremely unhealthy, where a lot of them drink a lot of alcohol, there's a big AIDS epidemic up there. And if that continues, then their population probably will never recover. So what we're seeing now in terms of what Russia's doing is mainly attributed to Putin and his very strong will and ability to be that strong man. So it'll be interesting to see who comes after Putin and what type of leader they'll be. And if Putin remains the um, leader for a while, then he'll continue using Russia's strengths. And that would also explain why Putin has introduced so many uh, pro-family uh, policies, because as you just described there, uh, Russian uh, demography and its future are decadent. It is, yeah. Um, they have never really had a very strong family structure, especially during the Soviet Union. So him bringing in a lot of this now is him attempting to uh, fix that issue and at least for the, uh, the foreseeable future. But in terms of if that will work is up for debate because if you want to bring government policies to 
fix the family, although it does work sometimes, it requires a very strong economy, very a uh, lot of money for the government to implement that. A uh, perfect example is in Australia, the um, baby bonus that we had under the Howard government. It did increase the fertility rate, but it cost a lot of money. And you have to ask the question, do you want the government to be spending that much money and create another bureaucracy to improve the fertility where we can possibly do that with other things and the, the, the private um, enterprise? I think the, uh, the opinion on, on, the, on the right uh, in the current year, because that was back in 2000 and three i think the the baby bonus um it's it's talked about the yeah fertility in, in western nations and that uh the solution is not to increase local fertility uh but to import more immigrants and it was interesting that tony abbott uh, went to visit hungary uh with victor Orban, uh who mm. has also introduced these pro uh, family policies like including incentives to have large families and it's been widely reported tony abbott's speech he talked about the you know, he's always been pro-family and the best uh, immigrants to a nation are the, the children of people of the local population. Yeah, and that's why we keep saying it's immigration is a temporary issue to that overall fertility problem where it's just only going to delay the eventual decline. So the most the best course of action is to see what these Eastern countries are doing, like Hungary and Poland, who are trying to create these family policies to be able to fix this issue. Yeah, it's it's certainly that uh, all Western nations uh, are facing, and some are more proactive than others, such as I mentioned, mm. uh, Hungary. And but a lot of like Australia doesn't know what they they want to do about it at the moment. But it's certainly it's talked about, especially in conservative nationalist circles, because uh, our governments uh, it's a bipartisan thing that we need. Uh, this high immigration number to basically keep the the economy going like a like a Ponzi scheme, and uh, a lot of people are noticing this. And there's this underlying pressure that you know, we, because obviously there's you're not just importing more Australians who are going to assimilate immediately. Uh, you're importing different different cultures and religions. It's and and that opens up a whole lot of other. Uh, uh, issues in in Australian society. Yeah, that's that's it as well. Is that a lot of these immigrants also? If you look at their countries as well, they're going through the same issue. And currently, it's mainly from uh, countries like the England and the UK where they have fertility issues as well. But eventually, that's going to slow down, and all we're going to get is from these countries that are entirely different culture to us. And the question is, are they going to be able to assimilate to our culture? And if not, then we're going to just create a lot of tensions as well now this is as i've said the it's a bipartisan policy that we need high levels of immigration but or at least the the morrison government and turnbull and abbott governments they they want controlled and strict immigration and it all started with tony abbott uh, stopping the boats uh when he came to office in 2013 because kevin Rudd opened the floodgates in 2008 50 000 illegal uh, uh, people showed up on our shores, a thousand drowned at sea, the detention centers on Christmas Island and uh, elsewhere. Uh, Manus Island were completely uh, full and everyone told Tony Abbott uh, it couldn't be done stopping the boats. He did. And the Scott Morrison was immigration minister at the time. Then Peter Dutton uh, took over and now he's home affairs minister. And he's basically been uh, the the hard tough man of the of of the government basically we're not going to give any ground on this where we're, we're not going to open the door slightly so the boats can turn back and peter dutton he's also called out a lot of the the refugee asylum seeker uh fraud uh, uh, uh the, the 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 fraudulent uh claims uh, like is called some of them uh, Amani uh, refugees because they come on boats and they've got all of these uh, expensive clothing and they seem to have mobile phones but they suddenly have uh, no papers and of course the the refugee asylum seeker activists uh, they're always yeah, call, uh, saying that he's the the, the cruelest uh, 
politician in the parliament, uh, he's, he's a monster, he's got no soul, he's a fascist, uh, all sorts of uh, horrible things. And they've been going after him lately about this uh, uh, Tamil uh, family who settled in uh, uh, Billawa in, in uh, central Queensland, and they found not to be refugees by not just Peter Dutton and Home Affairs Department, but by multiple courts, and there's there's now going to, they've been moved to Christmas Island and uh, uh, the federal court has now decided that I think it's the federal court I should make it just yeah one of our one of our yes federal court yes has has said uh, they can stay in Australia until because they've had children here in Australia the two year old her whether she, uh, she is entitled to birthright citizenship, which is why Peter Dutton called them anchor babies. Again, you know, not afraid mm. of using the language there. Um, but uh, they're, they're on Christmas Island at the moment. And of course, the, the refugee activists say that uh, they're, oh, they're locked up in cages. It's the same thing that uh, they've accused Trump of doing at the, the US-Mexico uh, border and that we torture uh, refugees. And now you've uh, immigration is one of your your work backgrounds, so um, you can obviously help uh, debunk some of that hysteria. Yeah, uh, so I was a security guard on Christmas Island, and we saw a lot of the system, and they were treated very fine. They had rooms better than we did on the island. We had small, tiny, little single room shared with another security guard. When they had these big rooms with TVs, Xboxes. Uh, they were given a card system where if they went out and played soccer or played rugby, they were able to go up and get uh, Coke and candy from the canteen. Um, and then they were able to have Facebook and internet as well. So they were able to talk to all these um, activists and these people who were very pro letting all the refugees in and tell them that they're in all these horrible conditions and they'll take photos. They had mobile phones. They'll take photos of themselves where there's a story where there was this one... Uh, asylum seeker on Manus uh, or Nauru and then he was speaking to a, a journalist activist saying that he's in these terrible conditions and then the journalist looked at this refugee's Facebook page and found that he was taking photos of himself on the island enjoying himself when he was tanning and everything so it's a lot of misconception about what goes on on the island and they tend to say it's like a it's like all these um cages and like a uh, fascist government to end the debate and make it look like they're on the good side so then they can end this horrible thing that's going on and have their agenda and have their way. Well, did you see any cages at all on Christmas Island? No, no, no cages. Not at all. I'm not sure if you've uh, read the book uh, Manus Days by Michael Coates. He worked on, on Manus Island, which was another refugee pro processing center and obviously that goes into a lot more uh, detail it's like a, a diary about what really uh, happens uh, on the, on the island yeah um, I interviewed him a few weeks ago in uh, one of our, um, our segments and he was exactly the same uh, Manus and Nauru uh, all these people that come here they're not there because they I seek an asylum there because they broke Australian law by trying to come here illegally and using criminal organisations to do that. And he found that a lot of the refugees, they were uh, hurting themselves and making it look bad so that they can get sent back to Australia medically and they'll just uh, assault all the security guards and everything. So it is the big issue, especially over there. Probably I thought the, 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 the most uh, blunt... Um response I've ever seen from a public servant in regard to sort of these hysterical uh, politicians about uh, asylum seekers and refugees is uh, Mike Pizzullo, who's the, the Secretary of the Department of Home Affairs. Obviously, he's in center of controversy with regard to media freedom at the, the moment, but he was being questioned by uh, Nick McKim in Senate Estimates one time. And Nick McKim said, you've been torturing people, have, again, haven't you? And he's like, we do not torture people. The only torture I'm aware of is that we sometimes have to appear before these committees. And then Nick <laughs> McKim was like, I hardly think torture is a laughing matter. And then he basically says, I, 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 this is why I call it a blunt moment. Uh, Mike Pizzullo says, well, basically, I don't know how to get through to you on occasion, Senator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Mm. That's always something. Uh, they're, they're so memorable moments that sort of stick out yeah. to you, even though they're a number of years ago. Well, I think it's it's probably footy time uh, now. I'm not sure if oh, NRL territory up there. Are you watching game tonight or? Uh, no, not me. I'll probably be back to uni or something. I've uh, got a lot of assessments coming up soon, so. Yep. No, no, no rest for you. Well, I've really enjoyed uh, speaking with you. It's been really great uh, conversation and we've covered obviously local, uh, Queensland geopolitics and philosophy. So it's been a great chat. And yeah, as I said, the live chat, they've absolutely loved you. So I'd love for you to come on uh, again. And for those who are in the chat or who are watching this on, on replay, who'd like to know more about uh, uh, Young Conservatives Queensland or, or get involved, uh, where yeah. can they go? So there we got our Facebook website. We're on uh, all the social media, and we have our uh, website, which is Young Conservatives Queensland. And we are hosting a event up in Brisbane tomorrow. It's just a nice social gathering up in Darwin and Co. It's a pub in Brisbane. Uh, but if they want to find out more, there's our Facebook. They can send us messages, and if they want to become an active member, uh, send us a message, and we'll go through the process there. And of course, uh, what we'd all like is a, a national rollout uh, soon of, of Young Conservatives, because as I've said, you've done such a good job in Queensland and everyone's crying out for conservative networking. And yeah, you continue to go from strength to strength up there. So yeah, well, I think we all can't wait for the national rollout. Hopefully, well, as soon as we have a working model, we'll start expanding as we have um, over the last couple of years. All right, uh, take care. And I'll leave all the, the links uh, in, the, in the show notes page. Now I've got to transition the scene to, to back to uh, myself. So uh, I'll bid you uh, farewell for now. Uh, thank you so much for, for, for coming on. And yeah, keep up the, the great work. And yeah, good luck with your studies. Thanks, Tim. Thank you for having me. Thanks for tuning in to Wilmsfront. Visit timwilms.com or Rational Rise TV to view the archive of episodes. And keep visiting theunshackled.net to view all our shows. And to keep up with the latest real news and analysis.